Well, if you haven't been here for a couple of weeks, we started a new sermon series called The Peacemaker. Um, The ideas come directly from a book called The Peacemaker. I'm very creative in my sermon titles, right? Um, Ken Sandy is the author. Ken is a uh, Christian lawyer who specializes in conflict resolution. He's out in Montana. And they have a peacemaker's ministry. If you have a business or, or something that you might benefit from this, they have all kinds of resources. They give most all of it away for free. And uh, they would love to bless you with that if you want to look that up. It's peacemakers.net off the top of my head. All kinds of good stuff there. And as we've been working through this, we saw the very first Sunday as we were going through the sermon series. And you can find these online too if you missed. But the first week we talked about finding ways to glorify God in the midst of our conflict. Because you see, as the world has conflict, it responds in a very specific way. But as Christians, Jesus calls us to respond differently. And one of the things you will find is if you respond to people in conflict in a Christ-like way, they will begin to notice that, hold on a second, I didn't expect that response. Why did you do that? That's a little strange, maybe a little weird, almost a little frightening. You didn't, you didn't hit me back when I hit you. You didn't say bad things about me when I said bad things about you. What, what's going on here? This is not how it's supposed to work. Well, we need to show them a new and better way, the way of Jesus. And as we, as we live out our faith and as we try to reconcile things in Christian and biblical ways, the world will notice. And what that does is it opens up opportunities for us to share with them why it is that we behave the way that we do. We can literally share the gospel in the midst of conflict. So that was our our first week, was talking about glorifying God in the midst of conflict. And then last week, we talked about getting the log out of your own eye. You know the passage where it says, you go to try to do surgery on your brother's eye to get that little speck, that little moat, that little particle out of their eye when you've got like a two-by-four sticking out of yours, right? And we talked about, okay, we we do have to deal with the other person. And we're going to talk more about that today, in fact. But before we go to deal with them, a lot of times we got to deal with us. And we got to get things right with ourselves. We have to get our own log out to prepare ourselves to be in a place where we are ready to rightly go and, and, and love people as we try to be corrective. And so that's the last two weeks. We're on week three, and then next week will be week four. We'll wrap it up and then move into the Easter season. And this week, the sermon is simply titled, Gently Restore. And this idea comes from Galatians 6.1. Uh, you'll see on the screen, there's Bibles in the chairs, and you can look on your phones or your iPads or whatever you might have. U version is a good Bible if you don't have an app. Uh, but Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Talking to other people about a conflict, in my experience at least, is usually a little bit unpleasant, right? How many of you like to have hard conversations with other people? How many of you enjoy conflict? Well, some of us probably, but you wouldn't admit it publicly, right? And... and, when we have to confront somebody, it's a little unpleasant. And we often, uh, many of us, let the tension build to what turns out to be our exploding point. And then we confront people in that moment with a list of all the things that they have done wrong, right? Am I the only one? You're awfully quiet. I don't think so. And of course, when we do this, this causes the other person to become defensive and then react with their own list Here's yours, right? Does that sound familiar to anybody else? Yeah. And this, of course, leads to what is often a very painful battle of words. Who did what? Who wronged who? How? When? Stuff you don't even remember all of a sudden gets dredged up. You're like, really? I didn't even remember saying that or doing that, but uh, okay. And of course, this never turns out to be good. It's like, it's like adding fuel to the fire of conflict when we get into this. Now, the gospel, however, opens the door for an entirely different approach to talking to others about their role in conflict. Remembering God's mercy towards us, in doing that, we can approach others in a spirit of love rather than in a spirit of condemnation. 
Instead of using guilt and using shame to force others to change their ways, we can breathe grace into them, showing them the wonderful news that that God wants them to be free of their sinful attitudes or actions. Matthew uh, 18, 15, great passage. It says this, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. When we're in conflict, conflict presents a unique opportunity to actually serve and love other people. And one of the most challenging ways possible to serve others in the midst of conflict is to help them see where they may have been wrong or might possibly need to change. Now we talked last week about overlooking offenses. And although many offenses, small things, can and probably should be overlooked, some problems are are so harmful that they must be dealt with and discussed. Now this, of course, is is delicate and and tricky work. But if we do it with a a godly attitude, it can be done in life-changing ways. Today I hope to give you maybe some, some tools, some, some guidelines, so to speak, on, on when and how you should go and privately talk to another person about his or her contribution to your conflict. But before I, I get into those, I need to give you a bit of warning. You need to know that restoring means more than confronting. Now as you may have noted, and I mentioned it, the, the title of today's sermon is Gently restore. See, just before Matthew 18, 15 that I read just a moment ago, Jesus uh, tells us about this great little story. I used it actually Wednesday in our kids' ministry. And Jesus tells us to go to the person, of course, who has sinned and, 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 and talk to them. But right before that, he gives us this genius little passage, the parable of the lost sheep. Matthew 18, 12 through 14 tells us of this loving shepherd who goes to look for one who is lost, leaving behind the 99. And then when he finds that lost one, he rejoices, of course. He celebrates and he invites everyone, come and, come and celebrate with me. I found the one that was lost. And it's with that idea, right before this passage comes Matthew eighteen fifteen, And it's the context of restoration. And to rightly understand the Bible, all of the Bible, we need to understand its context. What is going on? What is being spoken about? And what is happening? So as we enter into conflict and as we look at this and as we're talking about this conflict resolution, we have to have the mindset of restoration and not just confrontation. Now, back to the guidelines I mentioned on how and when you should privately talk to another person about their contribution to a conflict. We'll start off first with the whens. If you're taking notes, when number one is simply this. Face to face. When you're going to uh, deal with another person about their contributions to the conflict, it needs to be done in person. Text messaging? No, doesn't work. This requires face to face. Email? Nope. Doesn't work. The phone even? Not a good solution. Now, yes... This is scary when you have to go face to face. But we can't hide behind technology. When we go face to face, we're vulnerable, right? That makes some of us a little nervous. But what it also does is it shows that we actually care. That we are serious. While our electronic forms of communication are are wonderful things for many things, dealing with conflict is not one of their useful purposes. Going in person gives us a chance both to share our body language, which is important because a lot of our communication, if you haven't studied communication, is simply body language. And so having body language that people can read and see and understand, incredibly important. And what it does is it helps us avoid misunderstandings that happen when people read in too much to something we might have written or or said on the phone because they couldn't see our body language to have the, the full context of it, right? And so we need to go in person. And then... Not only can they see our body language, we can also see how they are reacting to what we are bringing. There's this immediate and visceral feedback. It's interactive. And a lot can be healed through very simple face-to-face conversations, even if they make you uncomfortable. 
The when number two. When someone has something against you. If you have learned that someone has something against you, even if it's an unfounded thing, God wants you, the Christ follower, to take the initiative in seeking out that person for peace. Jesus teaches this in Matthew 5, 23. Matthew 5, 23, Jesus says, Therefore, if you are going to the temple, right, and, and you're there, and you're, you're bringing your gift at the altar, and you all of a sudden remember, oh yeah, I've got a brother who has something against me. Jesus says, instead of finishing that act of worship, instead of finishing that act of reconciliation, because the offerings were reconciliation with God. You had sinned, you were making an offering to reconcile yourself with God. But Jesus is saying, if you're going and trying to make yourself right with God, and you realize all of a sudden, somebody's got something with me, he says, put that on pause. Leave your gift there at the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother, and then... Come and offer your gift. Now, if you're paying attention, notice this command isn't limited to situations where the other person has something justifiable against you. Mm -mm. He doesn't say that. You might be falsely accused. Jesus said to be reconciled with your brother or sister. It's very general. If they have something against you, implying that the obligation exists whether or not you believe their complaint to be legitimate. Jesus is basically saying here, be the bigger person, right? Don't let this conflict drag you down. Don't let this conflict just go on, right? Even if it's unjustified in your mind. And I think there's great wisdom in that. It takes a lot of humility on our part to do this. Pride would be the other way of saying, they have to come to me because they're just, they're wrong. I didn't say that, I didn't do that, I didn't do anything wrong. So, buddy, you need to come to me, because I'm in the clear, right? That's pride speaking. That's not the biblical way. And not only that, you can also have greater peace of mind if you have honestly faced any complaint, whether true or not, that someone might have against you. And in the end, as Christ followers, we need to initiate reconciliation out of love for the other love for our brother or sister, out of concern for their well-being. Because bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness are serious sin in God's eyes. He's clear about that in the Bible. And if someone has those feelings towards us, they are separating themselves from God. And these sinful feelings can eat away at them, leaving them feeling drained spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Even if they are mistaken in believing that you did something wrong, we still need to go to that person. And if you did harm them, all the more, you need to go to that person. But whether or not they are right, even if we realize they have no basis for their complaint, as Christ followers, we're called to live differently and seek reconciliation anyhow. And while we cannot force them to change their minds about us, we can make every effort to live at peace by clearing up misunderstandings. So when number three, we need to go face to face, person to person, when someone else's sins are too serious to overlook. In last week's message I mentioned, I shared about how God calls us to overlook minor offenses. But when the offenses are, are too great for us to overlook, we need to go directly and address the situation. Last week I gave some examples of times where we just simply need to overlook things. Is the sin slight? Or is it something that's dishonoring to God? You know, will others see them as being hypocritical? Well, then you need to go deal with it. Is something there in this Conflict that's actually damaging to your relationship. Well, if so, then you need to go and deal with it. Is what they're doing hurting themselves or potentially hurting somebody else? Well, and if so, you need to go deal with it. On a number of occasions, we can overlook minor things. There are things we often 
call them pet peeves I mentioned last week, right? And we get a little too bent out of shape about things that really don't matter, if we're honest. Like the guy who leaves his blinker on for 23 miles and drives you crazy. That drives me crazy. I drove halfway across Mexico in a truck with a guy who never shut his blinker off for the entire distance. Oh, that's a trigger. But I'm growing. I'm learning to forgive. Right? That's not the kind of thing to drag with me. You left the seat up yesterday, honey. Sorry. Not the thing to have a big fight over. Unless you happen to fall in, but that's a different story. (laughs) Sorry. All of us men, we apologize. But there's a lot of things we need to overlook. But there are some things that are way too important. That are damaging to them or to someone else or something that's going to make God look bad, make them look like a hypocrite if they're a Christian or something of that nature. We do actually have to go and deal with these things. And if you need further clarity on this or you missed any of this, go back and watch last week and then come back and listen to this week again to help you kind of sort through, is it something that I need to go to them for or not? Uh, AikenChurch.com is all of our sermons. You can follow it up there. Try to post them every week within about 48 hours so you can see the rest of this week's there if you didn't get to see last week's. But we have to be able to discern. Is this a big issue or is this something that I can let go as water under the bridge? And this stuff is so important, folks. Because that's the stuff that we're talking about in this sermon series can change your relationships and potentially change, change people's eternities as you find reconciliation with them. So I think it is worth your time. Now that we've looked at the things that we need to address within conflict, we have to then get to the how do we address it. How should we talk to the other person about our conflict? And so if you're taking notes, how number one, Bring hope through the gospel. It's that simple. Bring hope through the gospel. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speaking truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. When someone has disappointed or offended me, my natural natural inclination, my, my natural tendency is to come at them with the law, right? When you've hurt or harmed me or done me wrong, I want to give you the law. I want to lecture you about what you have done wrong and about what you need to do to make things right. That's how this works, right? But this approach, if you've done this before, what does it do? It generally makes people defensive, right? It makes them reluctant to actually admit that they're wrong. As they dig in, you ever seen this? It makes the conflict worse, right? Right? So instead of coming at them with the law, we need to bring the gospel. In other words, rather than dwelling on how they failed or what they should do, instead we focus on what God has done and is doing for them through Christ. We see this method employed by Jesus himself when he talks to the Samaritan woman at the well, right? Rather than nailing her for her sinful lifestyle of sleeping around with many men, Jesus spends the conversation with her, talking to her about her salvation, talking to her about eternal life, sharing, her, sharing with her what true worship really was, and about the coming Messiah. How does she respond to that? Does she get defensive? Hold on. You can't tell me about all the men I've been sleeping with? No. Instead, she leans in. She responds eagerly to this gospel-focused approach. She lets down her defenses, and she puts her trust in Christ. And as you may know, she, she repents of her sins, and then she runs into town to tell everybody, everyone that she encounters, everyone she knows, hey, I just met this guy, but, but here's what just happened, and, and, and here, you need to come meet him too. Come on, let's go, Right? Come to the well and meet Jesus. When we react with the gospel, this is powerful stuff. There are times when we clearly need to talk to other people about their faults, but we need to just avoid throwing the book at them. 
if we come looking just to hammer them instead of giving them hope, if we come looking to drill their sinfulness into submission, they're just going to get defensive. And we need to show there is something greater than conflict and sin. We need to offer them hope and offer them an opportunity for reconciliation. We need to be gracious as God has been gracious with us. In conflict, that's hard. This takes work. We have to be intentional. But the more hope that you give by focusing on what God has done and is doing for us, then the more likely others will be to listen to your concerns about them and acknowledge their wrongs and then to move towards reconciliation. How number two? Simply be quick to listen. An incredibly important component of communication is to listen and listen carefully. Listen carefully to what the other is saying. Knowing this isn't in our nature, James, brother of Jesus, writes this, in, in, writes this to the early church in James 1, 1, 19. James writes, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, right? Good listening is critically important if we want to resolve our conflicts. It improves our ability to understand others, and it shows that you realize that you don't always necessarily have all of the right answers. And it tells the other person that you value his or her thoughts and opinions, even if you don't agree with them. God gave us one mouth and two ears. We should use them in that ratio, right? Especially in conflict. Be quick to listen. How number three. A wise tongue brings healing. A third element of effective communication in the times of conflict is the ability to speak to others in clear and constructive manners. Proverbs 12.18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. As I've mentioned throughout this series of sermons, peacemakers are people who breathe grace into others in the midst of our conflict. Within that, we need to be generous in our assumptions. If people sense that you've already jumped to conclusions about them and that you enjoy finding fault in them, they're going to shut down. They're they're, they're just going to completely resist any form of correction that you might bring. So we need to breathe grace in the midst of conflict. And along with that, as we do that, we have to speak the truth in love. While strong words might be needed, We need to choose those words very carefully. As you probably already know, if you choose the wrong words, you can trigger defensiveness, right? And it's difficult then to move that conversation back onto the path towards reconciliation. If you've put somebody on the defensive, it's hard to get it back to a friendly place. The final portion of having a wise tongue is that when you are showing others their faults, you, you have to avoid talking down to them as though... You are faultless, right? As though they are inferior to you. One of the best ways to enter into a conversation about conflict with somebody else is to first admit, you know what? I'm not very good at this. And not only that, I too have done this before. I too have struggled with this. I too have sinned and and, and I too have this this weakness in me. I'm not perfect but I'd like to grow together in this. And then, then give them hope by describing how God has forgiven you and how God is working on you to improve in this area. And as you, as you do that, it begins to take down barriers and it can lead to restoration. If, if, you, if you come to a, hey, I got this all figured out and I'm perfect in this area and you're broken and we need to fix it, everybody gets defensive. If you come in and say, oh man, you know, kind of a screw up and I've struggled with this problem and it's a doozy and I'm growing but man I'm not there yet but 
I, I see you're, you're maybe having some of the same problems that I've had before. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Are people going to be more receptive to that approach? Absolutely. When people sense humility from you, they will be less inclined to react to correction with pride and with defensiveness. The how is incredibly important to our success in restoring our relationships from conflict. Ron Crabill, who's a very respected Christian mediator, noted that effective confrontation is like a graceful dance from supportiveness to assertiveness and then back again. You don't get to camp out in either area. Now this dance may feel uncomfortable. It may feel awkward at first. But perseverance pays off. With God's help, you can learn to speak the truth in love by saying only what will help build others up. By listening to them responsibly. By using these principles of wisdom as we communicate. And as you practice these skills and make them part of your everyday conversations, it can and will revolutionize the way that you deal with conflict in your life. God calls us to respond to conflict differently. God calls us to be Christ-like. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. This certainly doesn't come naturally to us. But I can assure you that if you'll put the hard effort in, if you'll do the work, if you'll keep at it, you'll get better at it, and your relationships will improve. As we conclude today, I want each of us to recall to mind maybe a, a relationship that we have trouble with. I want you to think very specifically about a name, of an individual, a person who currently you've had some conflict with, or maybe have been in the past at least had conflict with them. Maybe a family member that you love but you just keep fighting with, or a neighbor you just keep arguing with, or a co-worker or a supervisor that oh, you just hardly can stand to be with, or, or maybe it's even a brother or sister in Christ who just... They rub you the wrong way, right? I want you to think about that person for a moment. I know this can be uncomfortable, but I want you to intentionally think of their name. You have a, a name in mind at the moment? You can even write it down if you have to. Don't write it down if they're sitting next to you, but <laughs> if it helps you, write it down. And I hope today's message will give you some clarity on what to do next in this relationship. Whether you need to have a relationship that, that the first step is you being healed, like we talked about last week, or maybe you're at that stage where now you need to go and have a conversation with this person. But figure out this week what that next step is with this person. How you can move forward towards reconciliation in God-honoring ways. And here's the thing. Take that first step. Everything we talk about, completely wasted if you don't do something about it. So this week, whatever name came into mind, commit to taking that first step. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean it's going to go fantastic. Doesn't mean next week you're going to be reconciled. But start. Start now. Begin to work towards it. Commit to being Christ-like in your conflicts. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we all have conflict in life. We can't escape. We uh, live in a world filled with sin and broken people. People just like us, frankly. God, we know what conflict is. We know what it looks like. We know the baggage that we have carried along, some of us, for way, way too long. And God, in this moment, I've asked people to think of a specific name of a person who we've had conflict with, a person whom we need to seek out reconciliation with. And God, you never promise us that it will be reconciled, but you do promise us that as we seek reconciliation, that you can transform at the very least us and possibly the other. So God, that is our prayer. God, I pray that we would be a people who seek to breathe grace into others. God, I seek that we might be people who live out this wisdom that you have shared with us in Scripture, that we actually do the crazy thing of doing what the Bible says. God, it's not about us being right or wrong. 
but it's about honoring you and how we go about resolving the conflict. So God, this week, as we go forth into this world, show us your way. Show us a new way. Show us a new path that we might be ones who lead towards reconciliation. And then God, as relationships are hopefully restored, may we give you all glory, honor, and praise in it, knowing that it was through you and not our work that it was done. God, we all have places that we've been hurt and harmed and brokenness. I just pray, Lord, that you would help us see those things clearly. Lord, give us the the, the braveness we need to move forward in those relationships. And then, God, as we do, may it transform the world. Lord, you are truly good, and we thank you that you show us how you loved us, that you wanted reconciliation with us, so that we might share that with others. Lord, continue to pour your grace through Jesus into our lives. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we conclude today, we will have a prayer team up here in front.